uh, Minister Mabel Welch as she will lead us in this worship experience, this, this musical experience. Before you, let's receive her with a hand clap of praise. Amen, amen, amen. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. The psalm says to enter in his gates with thanksgiving and praise. And praise. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Let us have our invocation. Our Father and our God, we do thank you. We praise you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, that you brought us here to this place at this time. Lord, that you would uh, move our limbs and give us a firmness and resolve in our mind that we would praise you. And Lord, we've come here tonight to hear the songs of Zion. Yes. Lord, we've come to celebrate who you are to us. So Lord, let everything that goes forward here be pleasing in your sight, a sweet savor in your nostrils. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. I'm happy to be with you all tonight. I'm here under duress. I got voluntold. <laughs> because I wanted to be out there where you are. So I guess I won't complain because they didn't roll me down here on a cart with my, with my 10 toes up in the air because I told my children that's not going to happen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I want to speak to you tonight about the occasion. Now someone asked me in the back, well, what is the occasion? I said, why are we here? We are here to praise the Lord. We are here to thank the Lord. We are here to magnify the Lord. Because what? He's good. He's great. Thank you. He is great. And the reason that we are here is to celebrate 190 years of this church. Praise the Lord. So tonight kicks off just the beginning of, we hope, a whole year of celebrating. Because I don't know about you, when I celebrate my birthday, I tell my children, it's a month-long thing. It doesn't happen at the stroke of midnight that I was born. I don't even know when that was. But so we are here to celebrate. So without further ado, to some of you and uh, others of you who know about the Dorothy Cotton Jubilee Singers. I had the wonderful privilege of knowing Dorothy Cotton personally. And I often recall a time when we were doing a show uh, at the Old Masonic Hall, we were giving a concert and we were in a very intense moment with an a cappella song. The theater was I saw the door open and I saw this turbaned person coming in the door and Dorothy flew down the aisle with ah! I loved her. And so it is a wonderful privilege that we have to be able to hear these singers tonight. We thank you Dr. Whitehead for uh, putting this, that's right. We're putting this group together for maintaining it. I know it's not an easy task, but it's a worthy one. And she uh, surely is smiling down tonight from the spirit world. Every time you sing that song, every time I feel the spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. He put dancing in your feet, clapping in your hands. Come on, Dorothy Cotton Jubilee singers, and give us some selection.
still stand. Yes. Yeah. I think about the history of this church and it gives me goosebumps to think that Frederick Douglass once stood in this very building, that Harriet Tubman once stood in this very building. So we're here to do a little bit of something for you tonight. We just finished a huge project on uh, Wednesday night and now most of the students, well, all the students, most, I, I have some students here today, but most of the students are home for fall break. So this is about a third of the seniors. So, and it kind of worked out nice because if we had everybody, I don't know what we'd get. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you pray for us, we pray for you. And we're gonna start off with a, a famous song, Precious Lord, Take My Hand by the, the father of gospel music, Mr. Thomas Dorsey, and you know the story. I've told the story many times. The song starts, or the song was originally started, was originally titled, excuse me, get my tongue untied here, Lord Take My Hand. But Mr. Dorsey was out promoting his music. Back when gospel music started, there was a big split between the churches. Like after slavery, some of the free men and women said, we can go back to our African aesthetics and do things like the way we did in Africa with the hand clapping and the very kind of charismatic worship services. And the other ones were saying, oh no, we need to prove to our white counterparts that we can be just like them. So they had, they mostly became Methodists. So... Uh, <laughs> That was a split. Yeah. So, but Mr. Dorsey had to go, uh, like in Detroit and places like that. And when he was out on the road, he got a telegram saying, "Come home, your wife has just died in, in childbirth." He went home, and as soon as he walked in the door, he said, "Your baby's dead too." So, he, and he said that the only thing he could say was, "Precious Lord, take my hand." Our associate director Emily Preston will be our soloist tonight. So we, we give you this offering of Mr. Dorsey's precious Lord. Test. <clears throat>
resurrection is called, I Shall Wear a Crown. You know, these, these songs of our ancestors that grew out of sorrow and pain and suffering leaves a legacy of hope and endurance for us today. And I, I think most people don't know this. There were three white abolitionists, Charles, Charles Ware, Lucy Garrison, and I can't recall the other person's name. <laughs> but they, they went into, uh, when the Union Army went into South Carolina, St. Helens Island, and basically all the slave owners left. So there were like 30,000 Africans that was basically they were freed at that moment, right before the end of the Civil War. So they sent uh, Picard and his cousin and Lucy Garrison, who's a, a musician. She was a, a, a piano player and she wrote music also. They collected these songs. Mm -hmm. The first book of, of, of spirituals, the Negro spirituals, was printed in 1867 by these three abolitionists. So they really. Um, had the forethought to write these songs down for the, because they would have been lost. Mm -hmm. So I'm so happy that that book is there. And I, I'm thinking I, I may want to try to have the crew record all of those songs. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Yes. Yes. That will be a big yes. project, so I have, have to get some kind of grant to do that. <laughs> but uh, this song is for Harriet. I Shall Wear a Crown. Where's my cousin? Oh, there she is. <laughs> Maria Ellis is saying, our soul. Yeah. And the reason we're sitting tonight, because if they stand up, they really can't see me, so um, they still sound beautiful. So. <laughs> sure. And our uh, accompanist is Mr. Emmett Scott.
Amen. 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 See, it's something about gospel music. Come on now. See, my students are so As I record, they said, something got a hold of me. I was singing and I started to cry. And I said, baby, that was a Holy Spirit. But you never know what you not tell people, no matter if you're black or white. If you're open, yes. something's gonna happen. Yes. Something's gonna, it's something about this music yes. that gets into you, the marrow of the bone, right. the soul. So when you to sing it, girl, sing it, child. Yes. I like that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whatever you wanna do. They encourage the singers. Because we never know. Amen. They to, why, why do you repeat so much in gospel music? Sometimes when you invite the Holy Spirit, right. he'll come, come yeah. right away. That's right. <laughs> it may take five or six times. That's right. the Spirit is. They want to see, the Spirit wants to know that you know. <laughs> I am not preaching about it. <laughs> said give her the microphone. Come on pastor, you got some work to do. Truly we praise God. I love that song. You know, I was so I solicited uh, Dr. Whitehead for these selections <laughs> because I had a purpose in mind. I just like to praise the Lord. Now, and I hope that you all are praising the Lord. You're not sitting there cuz it's not a concert. I think it said we were doing praise. And where praise comes, you must worship when you pray. Amen? Amen. Amen. Don't sit there and act like you don't know God, because, you know, we might stay here and tell you a little bit more about him. So I don't believe that's true. I'm looking out there, and I believe that people do know the Lord Jesus Christ and who he is. So come on, Pastor. You're going to help us with the next part. Come on. You know, you, this is your job. <laughs> he know he can dress me up but he can't take me out <laughs> amen, amen. Uh, I had the opportunity to discuss the significance of Harriet Tubman to this church uh, if you are to walk outside in the front there is a monument that uh, is um, on the on the ground by the grass, which denotes that both Harriet and uh, Frederick Douglass were frequent vis visitors of this church. Harriet Tubman specifically uh, sought out the church to uh, take reprieve from her journey. She also sought out this church to also teach Sunday school. There's a room downstairs next to the fellowship hall, which we believe is the very room herself where she would teach Sunday school and receive her reprieve as she does her journey on. And she's known for saying that she is a, a staunch, uh, devoted Christian, that God is before her. And because God is for her, she's able to do and move and have her be. So this evening, we have the opportunity, the privilege, to just tap into the spirit, the essence of Harriet Tubman through the person of Reverend Maggie Moore Holly. She will render her uh, monologue as it relates to Harriet Tubman's life history and everything in between. So my hope and my prayer is that while you are watching and listening to Reverend Ma Maggie Moore Holly, that you not see her, but you hear Harriet. That you, not, uh, that you not just listen, but you see Harriet. And as long as you are praying, she'll do the monologue, amen? At this time, we're going to receive Reverend Maggie Moore Holly with a hand clap of praise. Keep your 
come here tonight mm -hmm. to celebrate with you. Amen. To celebrate a church that's been in service for 190 years Amen. in Amen. service. It's been a service to old Harry. Mm -hmm. Because Harry has been through here many times. Mm -hmm. And a many times she's been served. Mm -hmm. She's been housed and mm -hmm. her, her passengers clothed and fed mm -hmm. and sent on their way. Mm -hmm. and this church has raised a lot of money mm -hmm. to help me do what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. Now I ain't always been in this state. Mm -hmm. I was born in the state of Maryland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kissed by God, that state was. But it had a stain again. Stain of slavery. I know from a child that it was not right for no people to be owned by other people. And I made up in my mind then and then that I was not going to be owned by nobody. Because I know that God made every man free. And I am a child of God. And I meant to be free. Oh, God is so good to me. God has been good to me for a long time. Since I was a little thing. And he put me out to work. Y'all know that slavery children didn't have no, no childhood. Had to work from the time they could stand up and walk around. <clears throat> and many a days I suffered. Mm. Tired, hungry, sick, cold, mm. heat. But I had to do what they say do. Mm -hmm. One of the times that kept me right here, every time I think about it, I was about six years old. No more than six. Because I don't know my age, because they didn't keep track of color children. So I don't know my age. I don't know how to read either. And I hear the preacher say that I was teaching Sunday school. It wasn't because I could read, because I could hear. Amen. I could hear the word. Amen. And I keep the word here Amen. in my heart Amen. and in my head. And I can tell you what they say the Lord. I can tell you. What does say the Lord? Mm -hmm. Over this time, about six years old, Master hired me out to this woman. And what I supposed to do was to keep this woman's baby. I'm no more than six years old myself, mm -hmm. but I gotta watch somebody's baby. She said, Minty? Cause that's what they call me. My name wasn't always Harry. Mm -hmm. My name was uh, Minta Ross. Mm -hmm. But I changed it. Because I was going to be who I was going to be. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Right. Now, she said, Minty, what you're supposed to do is <coughs> you watch this baby. And then when I get ready to sleep, you have to keep this baby quiet. Mm -hmm. Well, all during the day, Watching the baby, that was good with me. Because we played all day. <laughs> but come evening, when the night is still and dark, when everybody else is going to bed, I'm supposed to keep that baby quiet because Missy's got to sleep. Now she had this little <coughs> crib down by the foot of her bed where the baby was sleep. Well, I was sleep be next to the little crib where the baby was sleeping. Mm -hmm. Now at the foot of her bed, she had the crib. Mm -hmm. At the head of her bed, she had the whip. Mm -hmm. oh. mm -hmm. And she said, you watch this baby, but don't you let this baby cry. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm down here at the foot of that bed. And I'm rocking. Except for the creaking of that crate. Mm -hmm. I'm six 
portion of the Lord. So I get sleepy too. So then I doze off. And the cradle stopped the rocking. And you know what happened when the cradle stopped the rocking? That baby wake up. And that baby started to cry. Mrs. Wait. Mrs. said, didn't I tell you to keep that baby quiet? And she reached out and she grabbed that whip. And she began to lash and lash and lash. And she beat me till she gets tired. And the lashing was bad. But what was really bad? Well, she said to me, Menti, I'm going to send you back. You can't even keep the baby quiet. She said, you ain't never going to be nothing. Six years old. And she said, you ain't never going to be nothing. But I proved her wrong. Yeah. 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 I proved the wrong. Yeah. Because between me and God, yeah. 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 nothing is impossible. Right. And I learned that a long time ago. And I said to myself, my little self then, so I ain't going to be nobody's slave. And from that day on, me and God had this conversation, we talked to each other. And I say to God, God, why is it that we have to go through what we go through? Why is it that I have to be hungry? Why is it that I have to be cold? Why is it that I get beat? Why? Well, God didn't answer me right then. But throughout the years, for everything Every block that came my way, mm -hmm. then I see what God was training me for. Right. Sometimes when you're going through, mm -hmm. it ain't because you're punished. Mm -hmm. It's because God is trying to train you for something. Yeah. Yeah. He's getting me ready for the next step. God was getting me ready for the next step. God was getting me ready to leave and then come back. Mm -hmm. right. But you know, I gained my freedom by myself. Mm -hmm. I tried to get my brothers to go. They didn't go. I tried to get my husband to go. He wouldn't go. So well, I'm going by myself. Well, Just me yeah. and God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And God provided all these rams in the bush mm -hmm. to help me along the way. Mm -hmm. I went up through Delaware. And you know, when I got to that piece of thing, and all these things, that, all these things that God had brought me through, I just was so glad and so happy. And I crossed over that line, and I just stood there, and all these things just looked new to me. The trees looked new. The sun looked new. And then the jubilation stopped. You know why? Because I ain't had my family. I was all alone. Yeah. I decided then and that, I'm going back. And the people that was helping me say, Harriet, you can't go back. If you go back, they're going to put you in jail. If you go back, you're going to be what? They might even kill you. I said, I'm going back. Mm. I'm going back. And I went back. And I went back again. And I went back again. Yeah. <laughs> and all these people just kept helping me along. Yeah. Giving me what I need. Yeah. I know right then that God had made a way. That's right. Amen. And I say to myself, take courage. The Lord will make a way. Somehow. The Lord will make a way. Beneath the cross, I bow. 
Yes. You will take away sorrow. Oh, just let him have your burden then. Oh, the Lord will make a way sometimes. And he made a way for me. And I tell you, I've been blessed ever since. Some people say, Harriet, you don't have much. Everything you get, you give it away. <laughs> so now I'm going to give you something. But I want you to keep this for you. And I said, how you ask me to do that? How you ask me to keep it just for me? Mm -hmm. I said, now, if I got some bread. That's right. That's right. And if you don't have no bread. That's right. And I take Amen. my little piece of bread. Amen. And I give it to you. That's right. Amen. You take your little piece mm -hmm. of bread. Mm -hmm. and give it to you. That's right. That's right. And I take whatever I got and I give it to you. Mm -hmm. And you break that. <laughs> you keep doing that. Then right. everybody has something to chew on. Right. But you can't keep it all to yourself. Right. You gotta give it away. And every time you give it away, God will bless you with some more. Yes, he will. And he keep blessing with you yes, some more. Right. The Lord will make a way. Yes, he will. Somehow. Somehow. You know, I was not only did I come to this city, but up there in Rochester. Mm -hmm. To the man named Fred Douglas. Mm. Mm. Abolitionist, they call him. Mm. Yeah. Big mouth, they call him. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I call him man of God. Mm. Uh -huh. yeah. Oh, mm. he did some things for me. Mm. And I needed somebody to vouch for me one time. Because this sweet lady was going to write a book, but she said, we have to have somebody to vouch for you. Fred Douglas was one of them. And how he vouched for me, he sent a letter. And I keep that dear to my heart. And I got this letter here with me. I can't read it. I'm going, I'm, going, I'm going to ask the pastor of this great church to come up and read it for me. Will you come read it for me? Amen. Amen. Dear Harriet, I'm glad to know that the story of your eventful life has been written by a kind lady and that the same is soon to be published. <coughs> you ask for what you do not need when you call upon me for a word of comm commendation. I need such words from you afar more than you need them from me, mm -hmm. especially where your superior labors and devotion to the cause of the lately enslaved of our land are known as I know them. The difference between us is very marked, but that I have done and suffered in the service of our cause has been in public, and I have received much encouragement at every step of the way. You, on the other hand, have labored in a private way. Mm -hmm. I have wrought in the day, you in the night. I have had the applause of the crowd and the satisfaction that comes of being approved by the multitude, mm -hmm. while the most that you have done has been witnessed by a few trembling, scarred, and foot-sore bondmen and women mm -hmm. whom you have led out of the house of mm -hmm. bondage and whose heartfelt God bless you have been your only reward. Mm -hmm. The midnight sky and the silent stars have been the witness of your devotion to freedom right. and of your heroism. Accepting right. John Brown, a sacred memory, mm -hmm. I know of no one who has willingly encountered more perils and hardships to serve our enslaved people than you have. Mm -hmm. Much that you have done would seem improbable to those who do not know you as I know you. It is to me a great pleasure and privilege, a great privilege to bear testimony to your character and your works. Amen. And to say to those to whom you may come that I regard you in every way truthful and trustworthy. Mm. Your friend, Frederick Douglass. Amen. <laughs> Frederick Douglass. I had a whole bunch of friends back then. The one who was stand by me with their own lives at peril. Abolitionists, they call themselves. Do we have 
Any abolitionists today? Mm. Yes. Mm. All that is, is somebody that see a wrong and want to make it right. Mm. Want to get rid of that wrong? Mm. Oh, it's so much wrong today. Yes, it is. You know, we have just this many abolitionists in this city. Mm. You could change the world. Mm. There were 12 that did. That changed the world. Right. All you got to do is take your little piece and break it and give it to somebody else. And you take your piece and you break it and you give it to somebody else. And I tell you, when you step into the water, God going to trouble yes, he will. the water. Yes, he will. God's gonna trouble the water away in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's gonna trouble. Singers, uh, Emily Preston, you've already heard, and Amber Ward. Amen. Call her my Ithaca door. Um, they're going to be singing, Oh, What a Beautiful City. And Harriet actually mentioned something about this the spiritual in her writings, in the book, in the book that, that people wrote about her. Something to the fact there were 12 gates, mm -hmm. and if someone kept her out of one gate, she had 11 more to go mm -hmm. to get people out. So, and this song also talks about Jerusalem, and we will be remiss if we did not pause to pray for peace. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah I think there's, there's just, mm -hmm. we just, yeah. we need to pray. Mm -hmm. War is horrible. Yes. Yes, it is. yes, it is. And it's just, it's, it's just something mm. that I wish we could eradicate. Yes. 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 So we pause for all those people who have lost their lives in that war. Mm. So um, we bring to you now, oh, what a beautiful city. Amen. Amen.
applaud one more time. Oh, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I think they said so. Amen. I kind of don't want this night to end, so let's continue. We're now going to have Pastor Terrence King come and favor us with the reading of Frederick Douglass. Amen. Amen. I stand behind this sacred desk every Sunday to pour into people who are empty. And if you've ever visited, you would know that I could care less who's in the pews. Because I know what shoulders I stand on. There was a man by the name of Reverend J. Callis who was the pastor of this church. He pastored his tenure for three years, pastoring from 1892 to 1895. Reverend Callis would have a young son who would run around the sanctuary of the church at the time named Henry Arthur Callis. Years later, Henry Arthur Callis would meet another person here at the church and they would be afforded an opportunity to come to St. James to have a historic conversation on December 4th, 1906. All right. All right. All right. In that conversation, Henry Arthur Callis became one of the seven founders of the nation's oldest black Greek letter organization in the world. St. James is holy ground for black Greekdom. And if you did not know, the cousin of Henry Arthur Callis is Frederick Douglass. God has a way of making things full circle. But as of tomorrow, October 14th, we will be upon the 171st anniversary of the speech that I'm going to give excerpts from delivered by Brother Frederick Douglass. On October 14th, 1852, a man stood before a crowd gathering at the St. James Amy Zion Church at 116 Cleveland Avenue in Ithaca. His speech condemned the practice of slavery. And he urged the attendees to make their voices heard by sending a message to politicians who were in power and were supposed to be doing the work of the people. And that's not this time, but I'm just saying. <laughs> he wanted to convict those who were politicians to do the work of what they were voted to do. So will you allow me just a few minutes to just pull apart some excerpts from this speech and then we'll move forward in the service. Frederick Douglass would say, Suppose it were possible to put down the free speech, what would it avail the guilty slaveholder? Pillowed as he is upon the bosoms of mind souls, he would still be troubled if the tongue of every abolitionist were cut out and every pamphlet and periodical treating of slavery were carried to Washington and burned in the presence of the assembled nation and the whole history of the abolition movement were blotted out. Still the guilty slaveholder could not have peace bubbling up from the depths of his sin-darkened soul. He would come, he would become and be a victim of this terrible accusation that thou art verily guilty concerning thy brother. The Fugitive Slave Act law has taken away this excuse. Slavery is no longer sectional but national, no longer a mere state institution but a United States institution. And if it never was before, it is now an American institution to be maintained by all the powers of the American government. Within the limits of the American government, slavery knows no limits. 
Wherever the Star Spangled Banner waves, there may men hold men as slaves. There is not one spot in the Republic scared to freedom, but every inch of soil is given up to slavery, slave hunting, slave catching, and slave holding. Our citizens are compelled to fly from a republic to a monarchy for liberty. They fly to the paw of the British lion for protection from the devouring talons and bloody beaks of the American eagle. Gentlemen, I call upon your attention to look deeper into this law. You yourselves, you, your fathers, your sons, your brothers, freemen of the North, are compelled by this final act to throw off the dignity of manhood and become bloodhounds to send out and hunt down your fellow men. Are you prepared for the dignified avocation? I will not believe it yet that this constitutes a part of the finale which the Whig and the Democrat Party stand pledged to maintain and to maintain which they ask your votes in November. In conclusion, I will present that with what I deem to be the greatest objection to voting for the candidates of the old parties is this. The system of measures which they have pledged themselves to regard as the final settlement of the slavery question aim a death blow to Christian, religious liberty. A more deliberately and skillfully aimed blow was never even given against Christianity than is found in this Fugitive Slave Act. I have shown that the law is opposed to the Constitution. I would be quite as easy to show that it is contrary to the gospel and to the spirit and aim of Christianity. It is also true and contrary to the gospel that laws does not interfere with the forms and ceremonies of the Christian religion. It is, however, much worse in that it is directed against the fundamental principles of Christianity. Christianity commands us as we would inherit eternal life to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and take in the stranger. The law makes it uh, penal to obey Christ. In the language of W.M. Lloyd Garrison, we are asked by these politi political parties to damn our souls. Again, it would be possible to point out a more glaring contempt of the religious sentiment of the religious people of this country than is furnished in these two platforms. Now, I thank you, Mr. Chairman and gentlemen, that it becomes the Christian duty of the people of this country to rebuke the contemptuous disregard of Christianity by, our, by our political organizations. Whether they will do so or not remains to be saying, but, someone say but. In any event, sir, I trust that this convention has thoroughly made up its mind to go in and come out of the contest with clean hands. The words of Frederick Douglass on October 14th, 1852, as documented by Yale University in 1982. Let us all say amen. Amen.
You're breathing. Yes. You're talking. Yes. Hey, ain't nobody missing no weight. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's all right. Now we're going to let you show this beautiful group of singers, this chorus of choruses, choirs of choirs, your appreciation. We're going to lift an offering asking you to donate to this choir. That means you all are left out. (laughs) You know how when you're at the table, and the cook done cook the cook. You don't expect the cook to serve. The cook gets served. So we're going to ask that the ushers would take charge and help us lift our offering. Give God a hand clap of praise this week, man. I just want to uplift again on the back of the program. Uh, there are just some thank yous for those who have participated in the service, and there is also a QR code for Venmo. If you use that QR code, if you haven't used it, again, all proceeds and all donations will go to uh, the Dorothy Cotton Jubilee Singers. Amen. 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 I I am charged with uh, giving the closing remarks. Hopefully everyone had a good time this evening. Amen. I thank you all for choosing to be here. You could be anywhere on a Friday evening, but you chose to be here in God's house. And for that, we give him praise. Uh, And as we begin to uh, move into our final selection uh, for this evening, I just want to just have the members of St. James. Can you please stand? Amen. If you are a member of St. James, amen. Amen. We thank God for you. You and you. Amen. Amen. Can we thank Dr. Whitehead and the Dorothy Cotton Jubilee Singers? Come on, we can thank God better for their ministry. Amen. And last but not least, let's thank Reverend Maggie Moore Holly for her her monologue as Harriet Tubman. Amen. We thank God. 
Amen. We thank God for what God is doing in this brief moment. Again, this is a three-day celebration. Today was the musical. Tomorrow is the actual gala at Hotel Ithaca. And then on Sunday, we ended with a Sunday service. So please feel free if you have time or if you're not worshiping within your own congregation, please come and join us uh, this Sunday for our service starting at 1130. Amen. Amen. Um, before we leave, because I understand that the spirit was high as we talked about uh, everything related to the music and the power of music, as well as the voices, the voice and the likeness of Harriet Tubman, I couldn't help my own self but get emotional about what we were hearing and listening to. So would you oblige me this evening before we leave and hear our last lesson? Would you let me pray? Can we pray? Is that all right? Because I don't know about you, but someone on the sound of my voice is a witness that God is still in prayer. Amen? That God kept you. That God is still making ways. If you could bow your head with every head bowed and every eye closed. Gracious God, we thank you. And God, we thank you as we paused our spirits from this week just to talk about who you are. And God, we know we talked about who you are because we celebrated you in music. And God, we celebrated you in the spirit of Harriet Tubman. But even now, right now, God, our world needs you like never before. So right now, God, we ask that you allow your veil to reign over this country, reign over other countries. Move, God, from continent to continent, from home to home. And, God, we are excited that even when it doesn't look like you are in the midst, that, God, you have a way of reminding us that I'm still in, that you're still in our hands. So, God, we ask you today. Would you be with those who are poor? Would you be with those who are in need? Would you be with those who have infirmity in their body? Would you be with those who are dealing with death? Would you be with those who are having uncertainty, God? Right now, God, we ask you even, would we come against the spirit of depression? We come against the spirit of insecurity. But God, we invoke the spirit of being fearfully and wonderfully made. We invoke the spirit of being more than a conqueror. We invoke the spirit by understanding that by his blood we shall overcome so God we ask you this evening oh God that would you rest rule and abide on this land and God no matter who's in the white house God we thank you that you're in the lighthouse so God have your way oh God in this country let your reign let your rest and your spirit rest rule and abide to my brother and sisters under my voice God you know their needs you know their desires but God, would you grant them that which you've ordained and given them in due season? Because God, some of us, under the sound of my voice, understand that after we get through the test, there must come a testimony that by his stripes I am healed. That this joy that I had, the world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away. And someone under the sound of my voice this evening can still declare there's power, wonder working power in the name of Jesus. Wonder miraculous power. God God, it was your power on Monday. It was your power on Tuesday. It was your power on Wednesday. It was your power on Thursday. Now, this Friday evening, someone says, God, thank you for your power and your grace and your mercy. So, God, be with us as we prepare to leave this place, but never your presence. Go before us, behind us, to the left and to the right. God, help us break off some bread to feed our brothers and our sisters. And God, we, we know that it won't turn to us void. In your name, we thank you. In your likeness, we praise you. And God, we thank you that even with your word is glorified and our bodies is edified. But praise be to God that because we're here this Friday, the devil ought to be horrified because I still got to praise on my lips. I still got to thank you in my spirit. All those who believe in the God who sustains us through all things, let us say amen, 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 amen. and amen. Dr. Whitehead. about when we, when we leave this world, what yes, would be our legacy? Mm -hmm. I, I asked my students the other day, I said, you know, 
what makes a Harriet Tubman a Harriet Tubman? Mm -hmm. It's a simple person. Mm -hmm. But we're still talking about her hundreds of years mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's just something about your character, mm -hmm. your hard work, yes. your trust, yeah. that really leaves a legacy. Mm -hmm. Dorothy Cotton left a legacy. Yes. yes, she did. So we're happy to continue her, les her legacy through music. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Pray for us as mm -hmm. we continue our journey with this music and bringing people together. Mm -hmm. And I, I, t I tell people all the time, it may not be your story, yes, but we're telling their story. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Amen. Go ahead, stand.
I'm going back for a whole weekend, so I'll be back in literally two weeks. So, yeah.
church, if I could go to the church and 